If you aspire to become a master or an expert in any field, the most effective approach is to study the individuals who have already achieved mastery. By learning from their experiences, you can avoid repeating their trials and errors. This enables you to accelerate your progress and reach levels of expertise you wouldn't have reached otherwise. In this video, we're not only going to talk about ways you can reach expertise in a particular field, but also general lessons from the great masters of history. Lessons that you can use in your life, no matter whether you have something you wish to excel at or not. For each lesson we're going to discuss, we will look at a master who implemented that lesson and see how it affected the master's life, skills, or success, as well as discuss the lesson and related concepts in more detail. 10,000 Hours of Deliberate Practice Malcolm Gladwell, in his book Outliers, argues that expertise in a particular field requires a minimum amount of practice. Generally, that revolves around 10,000 hours of deliberate practice. He cites the research of psychologist Anders Ericsson, who studied expert musicians and found that many of them had accumulated an average of 10,000 hours of practice before reaching the pinnacle of their performance. In this study, the researchers divided a school's violinists into three groups. The first group consisted of the top violinists, which had a potential to become world-class soloists. The second group comprised violinists with skills that were simply good. And the third group included students who were unlikely to ever play professionally. All the students were then questioned to see how many hours of practice they had invested. What the researchers observed was that everyone from all three groups started playing when they were around five. What differed though was how many hours of practice they invested at each age. The students who became the best in their class began to practice more than everyone else. By the age of 20, the top performers had each totaled 10,000 hours of deliberate practice, while the students that were just good had around over 8,000 hours of practice. And the third group of students, consisting of the less skilled ones, had just over 4,000 hours of practice. The researchers also compared amateur pianists with professional ones, and the same pattern emerged. The researchers couldn't find any musician who worked harder than everyone else, yet they didn't have what it takes to get to the top. They also did not find any naturally gifted musicians who effortlessly rose to the top while practicing only a fraction of the time their colleagues did. If we look at Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, one of the greatest composers of all time, we can see that from the moment he was born, he was surrounded by music. His father, Leopold Mozart, was a successful composer and violinist at the Salzburg court, as well as a music instructor. At any time of day, Mozart could hear his father and his students practicing at home. When he was only four years old, he started taking lessons from his father, together with his sister. In the book Mastery, written by Robert Greene, the author mentions that it's generally agreed among classic music critics that Mozart did not write an original and substantial piece of music until well after 10 years of composing. The earliest music that is regarded as a masterwork was not composed until he was 21. So there's no doubt that achieving mastery in any skill or discipline undoubtedly demands a substantial commitment of intense effort and a prolonged investment of time. However, it is not only the duration of the practice that matters, but also the quality of it. The practice must be deliberate. Deliberate practice entails a thoughtful and purposeful approach to honing one's abilities. It goes beyond mindless repetition and mere hours spent on a task. Instead, it involves pushing oneself beyond the comfort zone, identifying weaknesses, and working purposefully to address them. Deliberate practice involves setting clear goals, receiving immediate and informative feedback, breaking down complex tasks into manageable parts, and engaging in repetitive exercises that gradually increase in difficulty. That's why a coach or teacher can be so beneficial. A coach possesses valuable insights and expertise that can help learners avoid common pitfalls, make progress more efficiently, and gain a deeper understanding of the subject matter. Their experience allows them to provide nuanced feedback and offer alternative perspectives, which can accelerate the learning process and prevent learners from developing incorrect or ineffective techniques. Additionally, coaches can also provide a source of motivation and accountability. They can inspire their students, instill a sense of discipline, and challenge them to push beyond their limits. While it's unfortunate that not everyone can afford one, having access to a mentor can be incredibly valuable for those who can. 
push through. Given that attaining mastery is a very long process that spans across years of deliberate practice, like we discussed earlier, one crucial lesson from masters that needs no extensive explanation is to keep going despite adversity. So while it's obvious that this is needed, as everyone is guaranteed to face setbacks, failures, and challenges, what is not that obvious is how you can get such strength. There might be no other better person in history to showcase this lesson than Admiral Yi Sun Shin. The genius of naval warfare, Admiral and Military General Yi Sun Shin achieved unbelievable success in his military career, even though he faced so many setbacks that would have destroyed almost any other person. In his 20s, even though his family was noble, and the military was not a highly respected career choice for a man of noble birth, and though he was schooled in the Confucian texts, he chose to study at a military academy due to the fact that it was his dream to become a soldier since he was a little boy. There he learned archery, horseback riding, swordmanship, and other martial skills. At the age of 28, he took the national military exam to become a junior officer, and it's said to have impressed the judges with his archery, but failed to pass the exam after he fell from his horse and broke his leg during the cavalry test. He still managed to walk to a willow tree, dragging one leg behind him, where he cut some branches and used those to splint his own leg, and in this way, he was able to complete the test. Four years later, at the age of 32, he took the military exam once again, but this time it was a success, making him the oldest junior officer in the army. He was then placed on the northern border region of Korea, where he experienced battles defending the border settlements from the Jurchen invaders. Yi quickly became known for his strategy and leadership and achieved impressive victories. These achievements, however, led his superior officers to envy him and fear for their own positions. So they falsely accused Yi of desertion during a battle, and he was thus imprisoned, stripped of his rank, and tortured. When he got out of prison, he immediately re-enlisted in the army as an ordinary foot soldier, and due to his brilliance and military expertise, he rose through the ranks again. This is a pattern that continued for the rest of his life, where he achieved great success, but paid for this by being arrested, tortured, or demoted. But nevertheless, even though that happened many times, he never quit his career and continued to push forward, culminating in some of the most impressive naval victories in history. But how did he have such a strength to push through such adversity? And how can you reach a similar strength? Well, that kind of strength mostly comes from being passionate about the subject and being passionate about the outcome that you gain from excelling in that field. Yi, for instance, as a young boy, played war games with other local boys and even constructed his own bow and fletched his own arrows, displaying an early fascination with martial pursuits. However, he also had a deep desire to protect the people from invaders, and by doing his duty in the military and becoming a better leader, he could better fulfill his purpose. This lesson can also be easily observed in Muhammad Ali, one of the best boxers of all time. While Ali had a genuine passion for boxing, he also was very passionate about what he could achieve with his success. He was a major figure in the U.S. civil rights movement, and he was involved in various humanitarian efforts and charitable causes throughout his life. He once said, When you saw me in the boxing ring fighting, it wasn't just so I could beat my opponent. My fighting had a purpose. I had to be successful in order to get people to listen to the things I had to say. So you see, passion for the subject is definitely crucial to give you enough strength to push through considerable hardship, but also a sense of purpose that can come from what you can achieve when excelling in your field is equally important. Masters also often possess a positive mindset, directing their focus towards what lies within their control rather than dwelling on external factors that they cannot change. This mentality empowers them to navigate challenges with resilience and grace. Moreover, a vital perspective for you to adopt is one of seeing adversity, or anything in fact, as a valuable teacher. By embracing this outlook, setbacks and failures cease to be discouraging events, but instead transform into opportunities for personal growth and become a source of knowledge. Collaboration A thing that is known for certain is that we are not and we won't be good at everything. It's impossible for us to be so. Naturally, we will have things we are good at and things we are bad at. One lesson from masters to remember is you can deal with this issue by collaborating with people who possess complementary skills 
or how business people will tell you, hire your weakness. Mary Curie, arguably among the greatest scientists of all time, was the first woman in history to win a Nobel Prize and showcases excellently why collaboration is very important for success. Together with her husband, Pierre Curie, they formed a powerful team, and their combined efforts led to groundbreaking discoveries. Pierre Curie was an accomplished physicist with expertise in experimental techniques and made important contributions to the study of magnetism and crystallography. Mary Curie, on the other hand, excelled in mathematics, chemistry, and physics. Sometimes they divided their research, with Pierre concentrating on the physics and Mary on the chemistry. This way, the couple progressed way faster than if they had attempted to handle everything individually. They managed through their independent work and collaboration to write many joint and individual papers, to discover the elements of polonium and radium, to do groundbreaking research on radioactivity, and to win multiple Nobel Prizes as a result of their success. Their collaboration is a prime example of what can be achieved by working together. Even when collaborating with individuals who possess similar skills, the endeavor remains highly worthwhile. When a group of individuals comes together, they bring with them a wide range of perspectives, experiences, and ideas derived from their unique cultural background, education, and personal experiences. This diversity leads to improved problem-solving capabilities, heightened creativity, and more effective decision-making. Collaboration, just like a coach, also provides motivation and accountability to the individuals of the group, both of which are significant contributors to success in any undertaking. When it comes to your work, details matter. In the world of innovation and creativity, the significance of details cannot be overstated. Both Steve Jobs, as well as Bong Joon-ho, serve as compelling examples of how paying attention to even the smallest aspects when creating something can lead to great success. Steve Jobs, the visionary co-founder of Apple, was renowned for his meticulous approach to design and user experience. He understood that it was the details, the careful consideration of every element that set Apple products apart from the competition. From the sleek, minimalist hardware to the intuitive software interfaces, he knew that each detail played a crucial role in shaping the overall experience for the customer. Jobs also even cared about the look of the parts you couldn't see. Once, he even debated for 30 minutes on the shade of gray that Apple would use on their restroom signs in their stores. Well, he may have taken it a little too far sometimes. From his view, every detail, no matter how small or seemingly insignificant, mattered. This relentless pursuit of perfection and attention to detail allowed Apple to create groundbreaking products that resonated with millions around the globe. Their meticulousness not only cultivated a loyal customer base, but also established Apple as a dominant force in the tech industry. Similarly, the movie Parasite, directed by Bong Joon-ho, became a massive commercial success, winning numerous awards including four Oscars. The film's triumph can be attributed, in no small part, to the meticulous approach taken by the director and his team. Almost every frame, every line of dialogue, and every subtle gesture of the actors was carefully crafted with meaning to evoke emotions, build suspense, immerse the audience, and convey a story. This level of attention to detail elevated Parasite from being just another movie to a masterpiece that left a lasting impact on its viewers. In both cases, Steve Jobs and Bong Joon-ho recognize that details are the building blocks of excellence. Each small decision, whether in design, storytelling, or production, contributed to the overall success of their work. It is often the subtle nuances that create a seamless and unforgettable experience for the audience or users. This kind of dedication to the finer points is what sets apart the remarkable from the ordinary, and it can be applied to almost any endeavor, whether it's creating a piece of art, developing software, designing a product, or providing a service. A head start might undermine you. David Epstein, the author of the book Range, Why Generalists Triumph in a Specialized World, argues that while early specialization can work well for certain narrow and predictable fields, it is not the most effective approach for many aspects of life and work, particularly in complex and uncertain environments. Having a head start by specializing early and deeply in a single field might sometimes undermine long-term development. 
When it came to education, he mentions an economist who studied the higher education systems of England and Scotland and found that in the period he studied, the systems differed significantly only when it came to specialization, as students in England had to specialize in their mid-teen years to pick a specific course of study to apply to, whereas in Scotland, they could keep trying new things in the university if they wanted to. But the economist found was that early specializers have an income lead, as they have more domain-specific skills. But when it comes to late specializers, due to the fact that they get to try more different things, when picking a field to pursue, they have a better fit, so they grow faster. And after six years, the income gap no longer exists, and the early specializers quit their career in much higher numbers compared to the other group. Moreover, he also mentions a study where the scientists that studied elite athletes found that, unsurprisingly, the elite athletes spend more time in deliberate practice than average athletes do, as we discussed early in the video. But when they tracked athletes over the course of their development, the scientists found that the elites spend less time early on in practicing their sport, and instead they tend to have a sampling period, trying a variety of activities and gaining multiple skills and learning more about themselves and their abilities before they settle on their sport. A similar pattern was also found in music, where the elite musicians didn't start spending more time in deliberate practice than the average musician until their third instrument. Roger Federer, one of the greatest tennis players of all times, had quite a long sampling period where he experimented with many sports as a child, including basketball, football, badminton, rugby, volleyball, wrestling, and other sports, before ultimately he became focused on tennis. These various sports and activities have allowed Federer to develop a well-rounded athletic foundation, which may have influenced his exceptional hand-eye coordination, footwork, and agility on the tennis court that ultimately contributed to his remarkable success. Engaging with various subjects can lead to the acquisition of transferable skills. For example, problem-solving skills honed in one field can be invaluable when applied to another. This interdisciplinary approach empowers individuals to draw connections between seemingly unrelated areas, fueling creative problem-solving and unique insights that can set them apart in their specialized field later on. And also it makes them more resilient and adaptable in the face of change and uncertainty. Their diverse experiences provide them with a broader set of tools to navigate new challenges and environments, as they learn to navigate different challenges and unfamiliar territories. And in a rapidly changing world, the ability to embrace change and thrive in diverse environments becomes a crucial asset. You will pay for the lack of social skills. The book Mastery by Robert Greene does a great job at illustrating the importance of social skills by presenting some parts of Benjamin Franklin's life. People that are great at their craft usually ignore the social aspect success requires, and as such, they later pay for their ignorance. Early in his life, when Benjamin Franklin was 12, he became an apprentice to his older brother James who was a printer that taught him the intricacies of the printing trade. Being an ambitious young man with a desire to become a great writer, Franklin found himself surrounded by books and newspapers in the printing shop. This environment provided him with ample opportunities to study and learn from well-crafted writings. As Franklin's apprenticeship progressed, his writing skills underwent significant improvement. In 1722, when James was preparing to launch his own newspaper, Benjamin eagerly offered ideas for stories he could write to contribute to the newspaper. However, James rejected the notion, deeming Benjamin's work too immature for the newspaper's standards. As Benjamin knew it was pointless to try to argue with James, he came up with an idea of creating a fictional character who would write letters to the newspaper. James will never suspect Benjamin as the author if it deemed those letters to be well written and will have them published. So he started implementing this idea, creating a character of a young female widow and sent a letter to the newspaper disguised as this fictional character, and surprisingly, the plan worked, as his brother published the letter. James continued publishing subsequent letters, and they even became the most popular part of the newspaper. Feeling proud of this achievement, Benjamin told his brother that he was in fact the author of the letters. While Benjamin expected praise for this, he was surprised to find James being unhappy with him. Over the next few months, his brother turned increasingly cold and even abusive to Benjamin. Because working with him became quite impossible to work with, Benjamin decided to flee Boston and ended up in Philadelphia. Unfortunately for him, the suffering caused by the lack of social skills continued. 
being once fooled by a governor that promised to fund a printing shop for Franklin, but failed to fulfill the promise, and ultimately resulting in Franklin arriving in London alone and without money. On another account, he was sabotaged by his co-workers. His biggest mistake in all of these incidents was not understanding the people he was dealing with. This is the kind of mistake that any of us can make, especially those who excel at their craft, as they tend to overlook its importance. Our survival and success depends on our ability to communicate and cooperate with others. And because of this, it's of utmost importance for us to understand people, especially the ones we are dealing with. We have to understand what they are thinking and feeling, what's driving them, and what are their motivations. Otherwise, we risk hiring the wrong candidate, making the wrong friends, marrying the wrong person, or we risk being manipulated or deceived by those around us like Franklin was. With that being said, fortunately, we've created a video dedicated to this topic, where you can find ways to improve your reading and understanding of people. You can find the video here.